Come on, let's give the Lord another hand of praise. Will you please? We are so uh, delighted and so happy to have our own brother Cody. He's going to come and share with us what is in his heart. God has blessed this young man. I'm telling you, God has blessed him. You know the Lord has blessed him. Uh, has given him wisdom and given him strength. See, wisdom comes with age. Wisdom is not necessarily given to just anybody. You got to live long enough to have an experience with God. And he has lived long enough. I'm not saying he's old. <laughs> no, just because you know he looks like me on the top, they don't make him old. I think he did it just to be cute. Man fell out. He just cut his off. But uh, the point is, is that he's a, he's a, he's one that is full of wisdom of God, and uh, he has an intelligence about himself and a knowledge about himself concerning the Word of God that would, it just will bless you. I am so happy to have him to come and to share with you today and to give myself a break. He's going to come in his own way and share with you the word of the Lord today. Amen. Come on, let's give him a hand as he comes. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, good morning. All right, first off, I do not shave my head to be cute. I was losing my hair before he was losing his. Now, there's a lot of things that I do uh, admire and imitate my pastor on, but I think baldness is something he imitated me on. <laughs> Just gonna let y'all know I was bald first. The other day we had the snow days. You mentioned how they interrupted our schedules. And um, the funny thing about the the snow days, one day I decided, I mean, I just never got around to shaving my head. And I normally shave my head every morning around five o'clock. It's routine, I just always wake up, shave my head. So I started to see all of the stubble grow around on the side. And I don't like stubble, I like my hair to be neat. I like it to be to where the kids make fun of me at school about having a crystal ball. And uh, I started looking at the hair growing, and of course it wasn't growing in the middle, just on the side. So yeah, it's not to be cute, that's what you know. This is a ne uh, necessity, is that what you said? Yeah, my response to my hair falling out is, I shave it. Uh, a lot has been said so far in these first few moments of worship that has been truly a blessing to my heart. The songs that have been sung have been a blessing to my heart. But I've got a personal question for you all. You mind if I ask you a personal question? Don't y'all hate it when people ask you that? Because you know it's a question you don't want to answer. Do you mind if I ask you a personal question? You might want to write this question down because at first you might not be able to answer it. You might be like, ah, you know what, that's a hard question. I don't really know the answer to that. So you may want to write it down. Y'all ready? Here's the question. Why do you love God? Why do you love God? I tell you what, cross out the you and put I. Why do I love God? You got to be able to answer that question. If you look in your Bible at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, it says this. But sanctify the Lord, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. The New Living Translation reads it like this. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. Always be ready to explain it. I think a lot of times, we're scared and we shy away from speaking up for the Lord because we don't know a lot of stuff. And the only reason we don't know a lot of stuff is because we won't spend any time with the Father. And atheists will shut us down because we're afraid they may know more about the Bible than we do. And believe it or not, most of them do. The reason why they know a lot is to shut you down. To shut you up. So for us, what we got to do is we got to spend so much time with God. We've got to develop our love for God, and we got to know why we love him. If I was to say, raise your hand if you love the Lord, almost every hand, well, I better not say almost. Every hand should go up. All right, every hand should go up. But when I say, why do you love God, some of you, hmm, that's a good question. And see, I'm a firm believer that until we can answer this question, we're never going to learn how to love each other the right way. All right. We have been so blessed 
over the past few months. And I do thank God that you allowed the Lord to order your steps in teaching us love. You know, I remember before the new year started, Pastor Coleman said, I, I, I feel the Lord leading us in this direction, leading us in love. And so the last few months has been so power packed with the spirit teaching us about love. You guys learn things like man is broken down into three parts. Y'all learn that, right? Yeah. You got the flesh or the body, you got the soul, and you got the spirit. Yeah. You found out that there's three types of love. Y'all learn that, right? Yeah, you have filial love. That's brotherly love. That's, like most of us have brotherly love to just any old body. Yeah. Then you got eros love, which is erotic or uh, exotic or sexual love, which I hope y'all only have with one body. And then you've got agape love, which is the supreme love, which is God's kind of love, which I hope you have with everybody. Amen. You guys have been learning this stuff. Here's the thing. Have you been applying this stuff? There's a huge difference between knowing what's right and doing what's right. My son is brilliant when it comes to knowing what's right. But the doing, that's the miracle. When I see him do what's right, I have to go above and beyond to show him how grateful I am that he did what was right. And he's, he's a strange one. He goes, oh, I did good, Daddy? And it's almost like I'm going to do bad so I can do good again, so I can get praise again. Just do good. Just do good. My wife and I, see, my life is pretty uh, routine. All right? I wouldn't say boring. I'd say routine. I enjoy my life. But it's routine. It's, I get up. I go to work, I come home. I get up, I go to church, I come home. It's pretty routine. I like routine though. But every now and then my mom, she'll call me, she says, sweetie, it's about time for you and Terry to go on a little date, isn't it? I say, oh, thank you, mama. <laughs> my mom would drive all the way to Antioch to take care of my two boys while me and my wife go out for a movie and get dinner. And you know, we enjoy that time together. Uh, I'm throwing hints in case any of y'all want to babysit my kids. Uh -huh. And so when my wife and I are in the car together, you know, I drive, I put my left hand on the steering wheel and my right hand is on the shifter. That's just the way I drive. I think that's how cool people do it. I don't know. But anyway, that's how you do it too. Yeah, that's what I fixed. So I got right, left hand on the wheel, right hand on the stick. And uh, every now and then my wife will, she'll put her hand on top of my hand. And then I'll glance over at her. <laughs> She'll glance back. I got to keep my eyes on the road, though. You know, when you look at it beauty, you got to stay focused, right? <laughs> so I'm driving, and she put her hands on my hand, and she'll look over at me, and I'll kind of peek through my peripheral vision. <laughs> and she'll say something like, baby, in that soft, sweet voice, do you love me? I'm like, of course I love you. Whew, got that one right. All right. <laughs> then comes the hard question. Why do you love me? Man, I need a Snicker bar right about now. <laughs> That's when you get that Snicker commercial, you chew and think of some stuff. But it's not hard for me to tell my wife why I love her. I love her gentle spirit. Where's she at? There she go. I love your gentle spirit and your compassionate heart. Yeah. I love your ability to plan ahead and see the greater picture. She's a planner. She plans months, years ahead. I'm not that way. All right. I love how you make me feel like I can accomplish anything except when I'm singing. She tells me the truth then. <laughs> she tells me to stop. <clears throat> stop singing. I'm tired of hearing that. I was praising the Lord in the shower. She asked me to stop. <laughs> I was like, baby, I'm praising the Lord. She said, I don't think God calls that praise. <laughs> I think he wants you to stop. I was like, all right, is that enough, sweetie? You want me to keep going? That's enough? All right, good. Because I was going to talk about how much I love her hot water cornbread. <laughs> but I would be lying in church. <laughs> My wife made some hot water cornbread once. Once. And she had a look in her face like, baby, you don't have to eat this. And I'm like, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I wrote a song called, baby, get out the kitchen. I truly do love my wife. She gets, she gets a little filio love from me, a little brotherly love. She gets a little eros love, hoping a little more one day, you know. 
And she definitely gets, <laughs> he's the only one I caught that one. <laughs> definitely, she gets the agape love from me. But I firmly think that I learned what agape really was when she gave me my first son. I think as a parent, you really do find out what unconditional love is. Because as husband and wife, sometimes we'll just chalk each other up and throw each other away when we don't love each other anymore. But when it's your child, I, I, I'll give you an example. How many of your children make you mad? All of us. Does the love diminish? Does it fade? Does you, do you stop loving your kid because they won't do what you say? No. That love is unconditional. It's supreme. It's always there. It's always there. You, you, you don't hold a grudge against your six-year-old child. You don't. And if you do, something's wrong with you. I truly believe that marriage and raising children are great training grounds for fine-tuning our ability to love in the hard times and the good times. Because everything's not going to be, as Pastor Coleman would say, cookies and ice cream, cake and ice cream. It's not going to be that way. Now, I got a lot of cake and ice cream. I'm very fortunate. All right? But there are some times when I got to eat hot water cornbread. <laughs> I'm just letting y'all know. Let me show you something interesting. If you have your Bible, look at Matthew chapter 22. And, and Jalen will put these on the screen for you. Matthew 22, and this is verse 36 through 39. Verse 36 says, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. <laughs> this is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself as thyself. Now here's my question to you. Which love came first? Where was love concentrated or directed first? You can answer that. To God. To God. My question for this lesson is, why do you love God? I, I told you a second ago, you'll never learn how to love each other until you first can answer, why do I even love God? Why do I love God? We cannot and we will not love each other until we learn how to love God and why we love Him. I'll never forget when I was small. Even as a small boy, I was very, very homophobic. I was terrified of homosexual males. It's like I didn't like them around me. And um, I'm still working on that as we speak. And one day, it's like I heard the Lord say to me, you can't be like that. And I'm like, why not? In the Bible, it's wrong. Why can't I just shun and stay away from it? And God said to me, how in the world will they ever know love, my love, if all of my people shun them? If all of my people tell them, you stay away from me, how will they ever know my love? What they attribute to church folk is hatred toward them. I heard a speaker say one time that we concentrate so much against homosexuality, but we never say nothing about adultery. Does God weigh either of those differently? No. Sin to God is sin. And so one day I was in the gym, and uh, one of my students, well, she wasn't my student, but she was in another class, and, and I knew she was a, a lesbian girl, and she said, Coach, can I ask you a question? As soon as she asked me, I knew where she was going to go. So I immediately started to pray in my mind, Lord, please give me the right words to say that won't push her away, but doesn't sugarcoat the truth. She needs to know the truth, but help me to say it in a way that doesn't push her away. She said, Coach, what's your stance on homosexuality? I said, uh, great question. <laughs> Saw that one coming from a mile away. The Lord gives you discernment. Before, before when she said, Coach, can I talk you for a minute? I knew where this discussion was getting ready to go. She said, you're one of those church people, right? I said, well, I try to be. <laughs> See, they separate our, themselves from us. You're one of those church people, right? No, no, I'm more than a church person. I'm a believer. There's a difference. There's a lot of church folk who don't believe in what we believe. 
And so she says, what's your stance on homosexuality? And I said, well, I'm going to be honest with you. And I told her the truth. When I was young, I despised it. When I was a little kid, we lived in Louisiana. Well, I was a ninth grader. And there was a, a guy on our street who lived that lifestyle. And when he would walk on the street, I'd walk on the other side. I just didn't want him close to me. I don't know why I was like that. We go out to a restaurant. If, if someone lives that lifestyle or it appears that way, my wife always looks at me and smiles because she knows what I'm thinking. I'm like, OK, Lord, help me to not feel this way. So she says, what's your stance? And I say, well, to be honest with you, I used to despise that. But I'm learning to. Um, and she jumped in the conversation. She said, accept it? I said, no. I wouldn't use the word accept. Because if I say I accept it, that means I'm saying it's OK. The Bible tells me it's wrong, and so I'll never accept it as okay. But what I'm learning to do is embrace them anyway. I'm learning to embrace with love because God loves them. And people who live this lifestyle can change. But they'll never want to change if they don't feel God's love from us. And we're never going to love them unless we know why we love God in the first place. Oftentimes, I think Pastor Coleman just said this. Well, before I jump to that, we worship God because we love God. You agree? Yes? You can say it. Yeah, okay. In John chapter 4, verse 24, it says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. See, here's the thing. Our worship oftentimes has been coming from the wrong place. Man is three parts. Remember? Flesh, soul, and spirit. Those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Our worship has been coming from the wrong place. And our love has been coming from the wrong place. Our love has been coming from the wrong place. And see, if our worship and our love doesn't flow from our spirit, it's going to dry up and fade. It's going to fall apart when things get hard. Love is not going to remain when it's from my flesh, because as soon as my flesh isn't honored, I don't love it anymore. Love isn't going to withstand when it comes from my emotions, because when my emotions aren't, as Pastor Cone would say, titillated, I don't love you anymore. Yeah. <laughs> the part of us that adores, honors, and loves God is our spirit. That's the part of you that loves God with, with that unconditional love. And see, our flesh can't even understand it. Our flesh can't even understand the type of love that God requires. You know, I know, look in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. It says, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Yeah. Now listen to how it reads in the New Living Translation. But people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them, and they can't understand it, for only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. So when Jesus says things to you like, love your enemy, we start rationalizing and saying, well, he didn't mean that literally. See, because we're trying to love from our flesh. That's right. That's right. Our flesh don't understand love your enemy. It goes against every part of who we are. That's right. Love your enemy. Yeah, but see what he meant, though, he didn't mean he meant that back then, though. Really? The Bible says I changeth not. That's right. That's what God said. I changeth not. If I require them to love their enemy, I'm requiring you to love your enemy. Guess what God wants to do with your enemy? Turn them to your brethren. That's right. That's right. He wants to change your enemies to be a brethren. How would your enemy ever become a brethren except they see love from you? So the flesh don't get it. And the soul is too emotional. <laughs> The soul is too emotional. When God doesn't give us what we want, we sometimes treat him like we treat other men. We stop talking to him. We spend less time with him. We avoid him. There's people in this church or that are not, that are missing right now 
who aren't spending time with God because God isn't giving them what they want. Forget that God has given you everything you need. He's not giving me what I want. And since he's not giving me what, my, what I want, my emotions are not intact. And because my emotions are not intact, I don't really want to talk to God right now. Have you ever been in an argument? See, me and my wife, we don't argue. She tells me to shut up, and I say, yes, ma'am. <laughs> but have you ever been in an argument and you just thought it was best? We just don't talk right now. It's just best we don't talk because my emotions are totally out of, out of whack. Some people go ahead and talk while their emotions are out of whack, and then they regret everything they said. <laughs> so your flesh can't understand it. Your soul is too emotional. Here's a very important question for you, and you got to answer this one truthfully for yourself. Do you love God mainly because he provides material things? Mm -hmm. Because if he stops providing them, what's going to happen to your love? Think about that. See, Satan came to God one day. And uh, he kind of snuck in line behind the angels. Yeah. <laughs> God was like, okay, hey, how y'all doing? How y'all, like, good day, good day. Well, what you doing here, Satan? <laughs> Satan was like, man, you know, you know, just coming to and fro, just chilling. Yeah. <laughs> he said, uh, you see my boy Job? <laughs> He's a bad boy, ain't he? That's a beast right there. Job is perfect. He's upright. There's nobody on earth like Job. Have you seen Job? You know what the devil told him? Yeah, that's because you give him everything, God. You give him everything, man. If you look at Job's life, he's got riches. He's got a family. He's got everything you can think of. I tell you what, if you took the stuff away from him, I guarantee you he wouldn't love you anymore. God says, all right, you're on. You can take his stuff, see what happens. So the Satan, he, he moves in and he, he, he allows the tornado wind to come through and knock down a house and kill all of Job's kids in one day. He has seven kids, all dead in one day. I think about that all the time. Before I had kids, I could watch commercials and it wouldn't, I look at a commercial, I look at the news and see death and it wouldn't bother me at all. Once I had sons, stuff bothers me now. I see a mother who mistreats her child, and it's like, why would you do that? Why? I see a public commercial and start crying. Like, what kind of man are you? <laughs> Suck it up. <laughs> Be a man. I'm watching a public commercial crying. Glad my wife ain't in the room, because she makes fun. Are you crying again? <laughs> no. <laughs> There's too much dust in this house. <laughs> my allergies are acting up. <laughs> so. Job didn't falter. He didn't fail. His love stayed strong. So Satan came back. Yes. He says, well, you know what? I didn't think about this, but he's still intact. Let me touch his body and I guarantee you, he won't love you anymore. So the devil inflicted these boils and these sores all over Job's body. He was hurting. Every day he woke up those sores. Every time he went down those sores, he just was sick of this. He was frustrated, but his love never faltered. And then if you look in Job chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, verse 9, it says, Then said his wife unto him, this is one of my favorites, <laughs> Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. You still holding on to your love? Man, I would have been and said, forget all this. No doubt she was in pain too. Those were her kids that died too. Yeah. No doubt she saw the bank account. <laughs> Whoa, what are you doing? Joe, Joe, jo, you need to talk to God because last week we had a quarter million in this account and that account says we, we actually owe $2. <laughs> Joe, you got to talk. You know what? This is ridiculous. You need to just say forget it and just be done with this life. Look at verse 10 though. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? I like that. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God and shall not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. He says to his wife, you can't just expect to get all the good stuff from God. Oh, I love God when life is good. But when the negative side of life hits, 
my love for God starts to dwindle. When every one of those runners came to tell Job something else had happened, Job's love never dwindled. But with us, as soon as a little shakiness hits, you know, I just don't feel like going to church today. I just, I'm not feeling it today. One of the greatest things that has been spoken from this church is that worship is not about how you feel. Worship is about how you feel about God. Do you know why you love him? Because if you know why you love him, your love won't ever dwindle. Because the reasons you love him are never going to change. And see, Peter told Jesus stuff like, you know what, I got your back, Jesus. I'll never leave you. I would die for you, Jesus. I, you know, I'm going to tell you what, these other dudes, they might leave. But me, I'm telling you, I will die for you, Jesus. Jesus said, Peter, I don't want to tell you to shut up, but you sound dumb right now. Because before the rooster even crows, man, you're going to deny me three times. Right. Peter's like, not me. You must got me mixed up with one of these other dudes. Because me, I am down for you. Right. A few hours later, cock-a-doodle-doo. <laughs> Peter had done it. Not once, not twice, but three times. He says, I don't know him. I don't love him. That's not me. When life gets hard, what's going to happen to your love? If you don't know why you love God, it's going to be a lot easier for you to stop loving God. When things got hot, Peter got up out of the kitchen. He literally got up out of the kitchen. So when, when we can answer this question, why do I love God? It will help us through our Job and Peter moments. See, we sing songs. We sing songs that, and Pastor Coleman was just trying to get y'all to sing. Don't sing, sing. Sing. Do you, see, sing. If you know why you love God, you will sing. You won't sing, you will sing. You will sing, I mean, you, he's got to stop you from singing, stop. Like my wife, tell me, stop it. The kids don't even like it, baby. <laughs> my son is so off beat and off tune. I'm like, poor dude. I don't, but I don't ever want to ruin his praise. Sing that song. It's hurting daddy's ears, but sing it. <laughs> sing it. He sang, he was singing on the way to church today. I was thinking, bless his heart. <laughs> this is going to come a day. Someone's going to tell him he can't sing too. <laughs> but until then, praise the Lord, son. We sing songs like, I am a friend of God. You are mindful of me, that you hear me when I call. Perfect. Who am I that you're mindful of me when I call you? Now, God calls us and we act like it's a disconnection, but we call him and he says, hey, what's up? What you need, Brother Cody? I'm here for you. Man, I've been waiting for this call. Who am I that you're mindful of me, that you hear me when I call? You are thinking of me, that you love me. It's amazing. It's what? I said, it's amazing. It's what? You didn't hear me? It's amazing. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. I'm a friend of God. Mm. Not because I say I'm a friend. All right. But he says it. All right. See, we say we're friends with a lot of men. That's my friend. They don't even know you. <laughs> and we even say it about God. Yeah, I love God. Nobody can tell me if I do and I don't love God. Really? 
Now, I can show you in the Bible where I can tell you if you really love God or not. I'm not judging you. I'm just telling you what you just said is a false statement because I can tell you if you really love God. How you going to tell me if I really love God? Because the Bible tells me that those who love me keep my commandments. Amen. Your life is so far away from his commandments that you do not love him. Mm. You can't convince me you love him if your life doesn't match his word. That's right. Amen. So I am a friend of God. The first time I heard that song, I cried. Mm. I cried. I'm telling you, not like little one. Two. I mean, I literally had to use about three Kleenexes. My nose is running. I'm up in the sound booth hoping Jalen ain't looking at me. <laughs> this dude here, man, crying again? Man, I got to get down on the floor where they ain't crying all the time. <laughs> when I heard those words, I'm a friend of God, he calls me friend, it did something to me. It made me appreciate him that he loves me, he's mindful of me, and then when I call on him, he hears me. Amen. We sing songs like, I love you, Lord, today. I love you, I love you, I love you, Lord, today. Because you cared for me in such a special way. That's why I praise you. I lift you up in a man. Did y'all hear those words? Yes. See, you guys have sang that song before, but did you sing that song? All right. Thank you. Because when you start to think about the words of that song, some of these things will reveal to you why you love God. Because he paid the price for me way back on Calvary. I sing that song differently now. I sing that song from my spirit not my flesh. I sing that song from my spirit, not my soul. Because when things get hard, I don't feel like singing. But when that song comes on, I got to sing because my spirit tells me, do you remember what he did for you on Calvary? When you take communion and you open up that cracker, you have that cracker in your hand, does your imagination go back? to them sitting around that table, to Jesus telling them that this is my body, which is broken for you. When you drink that juice, does it go back to that table? When he says, this is my blood, drink it in remembrance of me. Or do you just, it's another ritual of worship. Because if you know why you love God, all of these things take on a different meaning. Now, can I share with you a few reasons why I love God? Let's see if we got the same answers on our papers, shall we? And since I've been up here, I won't accuse y'all of cheating. The first reason why I love God is because he loved me first. He loved me first. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10. Look at this. Here it is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You want to know what love is? Love is God sending his son for me. Now, I told you before, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, so I look up words that I don't know what they mean. Propitiation is over my head. Now, I heard Pastor Coleman say what it is. It means the substitute. But I want to look it up to see what Webster said. 
All right? So this is what Webster says. It says, propitiate means to make someone pleased or less angry by giving or saying something desired. You propitiate. I say or do something to ease your anger, to please you. So if Jesus is the propitiation for my sins, Jesus was what pleased the penalty for my sins. Thank you, Lord. He's the reason why my sins don't count against me anymore. And I didn't have to go look for him. He came looking for me. So the first reason I love you, Jesus, you love me first. Verse 19, same chapter, verse 19 says we love him because he first loved us. We love him because he first loved us. The second reason I love God, he saved me. He saved me. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 says, But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for me not after I got clean. He died for me not after I decided to submit my heart to him. He died for me before I knew who he was. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But, but, the master of the sea, he heard my despairing cry. And from the waters he lifted me. Now safe am I. He saved me. I love God because he loved me first. And I love God because he saved me. Pastor Coleman says something, and he said it two or three times now. He says, you got to think about how old you are. And that's how long God has been loving you in spite of you. Now, I'm 37 years old. I know you thought it was 25, but I'm going to be honest. I'm 37. You can tell by the extreme six-pack, right? All right. I'm 37 years old, and in those 37 years, I've done enough wrong and sin to satisfy 10 men's lifetimes. I'm gonna be honest with you, I've never been, I wasn't always the good brother Cody. There was times I was a bad, watch your mouth. <laughs> he saved me even though he knew I was a blank. You fill in the blank. He saved me even though I was a blank. A liar, a cheater, an adulterer, a drug addict, an alcoholic, a gambler, uh, whatever the blank is in your life, he saved you even though you were a blank. Because one day you weren't going to be a blank anymore. He saved me even though I was going to do blank. Fill it in. Lie, cheat, manipulate, use profanity take his name in vain. He saved me even though I was going to do that and sometimes still do. Not me, I'm talking about y'all right now. <laughs> ah, they're still awake. They're still awake. I love God because even though I haven't been the best son these 37 years, he's been the best father. I also love God because he has a plan for me. He has a purpose for my life. That feels good knowing God has a plan for me. I'm not just existing. I'm not just floating around on earth with no direction. God actually has a plan for me. In Jeremiah 29 and 11, it says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Now, the NIV reads it a little different. I like the way the NIV says it. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. That's why I love you, God. I love you because you got a plan for me. You know the direction you want my life to go. And you're willing to share with me that plan. If you don't know God's plan for your life, it's because you haven't asked him his plan for your life. Now let me explain something to you. Once you ask him his plan for your life, be prepared to be shocked. 
it might not be what you planned for your life. It might not be. But his plan is the best plan. His plan is the ultimate plan. His plan is the greatest plan. I love God because he protects me and he has kept me from destruction. We sing a song here that says, Falling in love with Jesus. It's the best thing I've ever done. Falling in love with Jesus is the best thing I've ever done. Then the next line says, in his arms I feel protected. In his arms never dis... Remember how we see it? Disconnected. Remember that? <laughs> we had to add that disconnected now. In case y'all didn't know why we did that. Like, Clifford messed up again. No, that was part of the song. That was part of the song. <laughs> in his arms I feel connected. In his arms never disconnected. I feel protected. There's no place I'd rather be. Yeah. Psalms 91 and 7, and this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Psalms 91 and 7. It says, A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Even though all of the world falls apart beside you, God says, I'll protect you. I will keep you. Does that mean you won't experience any trouble? Does that mean you won't have any suffering? No, we'd be foolish if we thought that. But you won't have all of that trouble and you won't have all of that suffering because that's not what I have in the plan for you. You gotta live some way to get stronger. But not that way and not that way. That way will crush you, that way will kill you. Leave that alone. But do I follow the plan or do I follow my own plan? Because if I follow my own plan, I might crush myself. I will never forget years ago, the sound system was right over here where Sister McDermott is. We didn't have this beautiful stage and I was sitting over there and Pastor Coleman was preaching. It's probably been 10 years if I was to guess, maybe even longer, I lose track of time. And um, the, uh, he was preaching something heavy because People were shouting, they were into it, they were emotional in the spirit. And I, I remember feeling like, Lord, what's wrong with me? How come I don't have that? How come I'm not, what's wrong with me? Why do I not feel that same passion that they have? Why do I not, why am I not screaming? What's wrong with me? Do I not worship you right? Is something wrong with me? And I can still hear it like I heard it yesterday or back then. He says, no, nothing's wrong with you. You just haven't seen what she's seen. He says, you haven't endured what she's endured. So instead of you waiting for that to happen to praise me, praise me that I shielded you from that. Thank you, Lord. Every time I think about that, my heart does me good. And I love him because he says, Brother Cody, you got to deal with some drama in life. Mm. But this, I'll shield from you. Mm. That's got to go. Oh. Yeah, yeah, you're going to have to deal with some garbage in life. But if you stick to the plan, not that garbage okay. and not that garbage. So, Lord, I love you because you protect me. I love you because you're faithful. I love you because you're merciful. I don't know about you all, but I'm, I thank God all the time that he's merciful because sometimes we mess up and he doesn't handle us according to our sin. I love God because he's trustworthy. If he says he's going to do it, he does it. And he does it well. <laughs> Why is all these songs coming to me today? <laughs> Everything the Lord does. How's it go? He does it. Well, you remember that song? Y'all don't remember that one? All right, I'm going to stop singing because my wife gave me the cut. Cut. <laughs> cut. <laughs> I love God because he's the king of kings. Guess who you actually serve? You don't serve a king. You serve the king of kings. And he's mindful of me. And he hears me when I call. I tried to call President Obama yesterday. 
and my phone call kept on hanging up. They didn't want to talk to me at the White House. I didn't have a clearance to talk to him. 615, no, you can't dial 615 to call President Obama. <laughs> and so when I hung up the phone, then I called on the King of Kings, and, and I got straight in, straight through. There was no busy signal, none of that. And I'm like, whoa, I love that I can just talk to you whenever I want to. I love God because he's my God, and he's my Lord, and he's my friend. He can be y'all's too, but he's mine. I love God because he's all powerful. And any and everything I need in my life, he can supply. And God wants for you to tell him today why you love him. And I'm done. <laughs> we need you, Lord. We need you, Lord. Right now. We need you, Lord. We need you, Lord. Right now. We lift our hands and bow our knees and worship at your throne. We need you, Lord. We need you right now.